Introduction, I'm going to let Abuna do his own introduction. He's been around for a while, so Abuna, take it away. Thanks, Mike. Uh, my name is Abuna Demos, and I'm a Windows user. Uh, and I'm here with uh, Mike and Brad. They're both uh, engineers and ad guru. Um, we do online advertising competitive intelligence. Uh, so we're going to tell you a little bit about the struggles and the adventures that we had building out a Hadoop cluster, a Linux Hadoop cluster, and bolting it on to a uh, previously entirely Microsoft shop from you know, Windows Server, SQL Server, everything, .NET, C Sharp. <clears throat> so who is Ed Guru? Uh, we were founded in 2004. Um, we're just down the street. Uh, we, we've been uh, building out search intelligence tools. Um, we, we collect data on a bunch of search engines all over the world. We bring this data into our uh, data platform. Um, run different analysis over this data, um, estimate advertiser spend, and so forth, and uh, generate uh, competitive intelligence reports that our clients buy through our um, web-based subscription service. And this is just kind of a show you, shows you the pieces of how our, our data fits together. Um, we have search advertising data, that's SEM Insights, um, mainly focused on Google AdWords, but also on uh, Microsoft Ad Center, Yahoo as well. Um, Link Insight, which is a, a backlink analysis tool. Uh, display Insight, which gives you competitive intelligence on uh, display advertising um, outside of the search engines on the top 50,000 websites on the internet. And uh, Trademark Insight, which is a brand monitoring and um, brand protection tool for online advertising. Um, so this is just an example of the search results page. Uh, we capture both the paid search listings as well as the uh, natural search listings. Um, the natural being the ones that Google determines that is, are important and uh, are not sold through the auctions. Um, but we also provide uh, estimated spend numbers for all the ads that are sold through the AdWords auctions. Why we deployed it? It was not because we were bored and had too much time on our hands and were not nearly stressed out. Um, we were getting, uh, we were building out our platform and the amount of data that we were collecting for our clients and for our own internal kind of data mining analysis was just exploding. Um, and we, we sort of had this, uh, we had this platform that we built, you know, kind of in a really quick prototype a number of years ago and just kept on uh, beefing up and, you know, adding more SQL servers and, um, you know, adding more and more expensive uh, storage arrays and, and so forth. Um, and we got to the point where we would pay a lot of money to, to get more disks in our storage array um, and then quickly be short on space again. And kind of, we were on this treadmill of just, um, you know, constantly spending a lot of money and not having enough um, space or uh, computing resources. So Brad's going to tell you a little bit about uh, Hadoop administration and um, kind of what we went through trying to uh, build out these clusters, which we've been doing over about the last uh, year. So basically what happened one day is Abuna and uh, Rich, our, our CEO, come to me and go, how are your Linux skills? And that was my introduction to the fact that we were getting a Hadoop cluster. Um, so like Abuna had said, we were a purely Windows shop. Everything was Microsoft. Um, we had maybe one or two semi-open source products or, you know, at least open source based products. Um, but otherwise everything was was uh, Windows. So the very first thing other than crap is my resume up to date um, was how are we gonna fit this in here? Um, literally, last time I used uh, any kind of Linux before this came to me was probably five years previous. And so wasn't exactly up with it. Um, and so basically I had to figure out where it's going to fit into the environment. Are we going to do a separate Linux environment, separate Hadoop environment, and keep it completely separate? Are we going to be able to shoehorn it in, uh, in on there? Are we going to be able to bolt it in and whatnot? Um, and so basically the learning curves were where it's going to fit. Can we leverage our existing tools because we already had a great you know, monitoring environment, everything else like that. Um, and then my memories of Linux being less forgiving. Um, the example I have here is something that I did one of the very first times I was using Linux, um, which if you pay attention, that's a really bad command to run. 
Um, I was actually trying to clear the current directory and instead clear the root directory. Um, that's something that's always stuck with me and that's kind of where my fear of Linux came from. Um, and then the final thing that really was throwing us off was uh, who names these things. I specifically remember sitting at lunch with a couple of our salespeople one day, I think Mike and I were talking, and they thought we were making things up to try to confuse them with Flume and uh, Scoop and Uzi and everything else like that. And so it was really a lot of getting into the mindset of the open source community, the mindset of things aren't necessarily the most one well documented, I think we've discussed that earlier, or kind of logical in, in exactly how they work or how they're laid out. <coughs> Um, and then pretty much once we decided that we want to keep the environment as homogenous as possible, we decided that we should use our existing infrastructure and try to bring Hadoop into that as much as possible. One of the very first things we came across was Active Directory. While it implements the LDAP protocol, it is not an LDAP directory service. Um, and so basically, <coughs> we just found that there were hundreds of little tiny things that Microsoft has done to change the RFC that make it almost incompatible until you figure out what they've done and you can figure out how to work around it. Um, the other thing we wanted to do was create a seamless user experience. The developers will tell you now they already hate me because they have very rapidly changing passwords for certain things um, and a lot of passwords for things. And so if I was going to give them another set of passwords to log into the Hadoop boxes and another one to get into queue and another one to do Hive and everything else like that, I'm pretty sure they would have murdered. Um, and then obviously in order to get Active Directory to work on these machines and integrate it with queue and everything else like that, you got to get the machines on the domain and I don't know if anybody here has really ever dealt with that before. It's not an easy or fun um, process and you can usually blame Kerberos for that. So there's always going to be something that we found with the ticketing's wrong, or there's a time shift, or, or time skew, or something like that. Um, and then the other thing that we kind of had to work around was how we were going to move data from our Windows environment into the Hadoop environment. Um, SMB or Samba, it's really not worth it. Um, can play connectivity with uh, basically our Linux box, between the Linux boxes and the Windows boxes, things like that. Uh, transfers were slow. Uh, we did find that NFS worked much better at faster transfer speeds, but it still didn't get us into Hadoop. It just got us into Linux. Um, so what we ended up going with was uh, the mountable HDFS or the HDFS views, which works really nicely from a Linux environment. In a Windows environment, not so much. The first thing that we tried was actually um, using HDFS views um, and mounting it on a Linux box with NFS and then exporting that NFS, that mount as another NFS export for Windows to pick up. I would recommend that nobody even bother thinking about trying that. Um, it was the biggest mess of broken, corrupted files, blocks being put out of order, everything. Um, and then a few days later, I actually saw documentation on it where they tell you not to do it. Um, so. It's nice when you can find the documentation. Um, but so what we ended up having to do is the same thing, but kind of in reverse, where uh, Fuse is mounted to a machine, a Linux machine, and then we SCP from the Windows machine, or SSHFS, um, to that export, and then that very nicely will drop things into HDFS for us. Thankfully, we don't have to use it that often because it is really kind of messy. Um, and then came monitoring and managing, the uh, big, I guess the big things. Um, again, we had this existing infrastructure for, with uh, Microsoft Operations Manager, System Center Operations Manager, um, Opalis, which I think they're calling Orchestrator now, um, and uh, System Center Configuration Manager. So, one of the things that we wanted to avoid was getting multiple tools to do the same things in different environments. And quite nicely, actually, I have to say, we've been able to get um, Operations Manager to do, it's got native uh, Linux monitoring within it, um, but we've been able to get it to also do a lot of monitoring for Hadoop and for the uh, other projects that exist 
um, just through custom management packs, custom scripts that will go out, check the logs for us automatically, see if there's an error or anything like that. Um, and then based on pre-existing conditions, it'll send it over to uh, Opalis. Is anybody familiar with Opalis? It's a uh, workflow automation system, basically. Um, and it's built on the concept of no scripting, so it does the scripting for you. Um, so it's, it's really kind of nice and kind of easy. But so what Apollos would do is pick up the alert from operations manager, see that a data node failed for whatever reason, um, and then based on whatever criteria, try to restart that data node, or if the error is because of you know something that it knows it can't fix, it'll actually go into the name node and mark that as a dead node, so the name node leaves it alone and, and whatnot. Um, and then the final thing is with configuration manager, it does not have native support um, for any kind of a Unix or Linux environment, but they do have um, extensions for it that uh, basically allow us to do any kind of patch management, any kind of a <coughs> software uh, distribution, anything like that, uh, straight from Configuration Manager. So essentially, these three tools let us monitor our entire win monitor and configure our entire Windows environment, along with the Linux Hadoop environment. Um, for example, with Configuration Manager, I have it set so that when we bring a new data node on, or you know, add a new data node into a wrap or whatever, Configuration Manager will pick it up, kick up, kick off the Kickstart script, install the operating system, get everything configured, then install the uh, all of the uh, components for Hadoop, and then copy over the config files, start everything up, and we've got the node in there, and I've had to do nothing other than turn the machine on. So it's kind of nice in that regard. Um, and then basically, just final thoughts on my administrative side is that Hadoop and Windows can live together. It is not a very good relationship half the time, um, but they do, for the most part, get together pretty well. Um, and Microsoft is starting to figure out this whole open source thing, um, you know, how many years later? Um, and they do have uh, like their own Microsoft SQL connectors for Hadoop, which mirror a lot of the uh, capabilities of Scoop, I believe. And then they're coming out with a ODBC driver for Hive, which I believe is going to be released within the next couple of months, if I remember right, which allows any native Windows application to interface directly with Hive. And then they've got their, uh, I don't know if anybody heard, they just spun off a uh, subsidiary, subsidiary rather, to work on interop initiatives between big data and the Microsoft environments. Um, and then, again, anytime that you're dealing with, especially Hadoop, I found any of the integration aspects with Active Directory or any kind of directory services, the problem's gonna be Kerberos. It's always Kerberos. Um, and then something that I just wanted to throw in there at the last two is that and I think most people are probably doing this. So I'll start with what I was going to say. Oh. If you like Kerberos, are you using Microsoft Kerberos or MIT version Kerberos? Microsoft Kerberos. That's why you can always blame it. <laughs> Again, uh, RFCs exist for a reason. Microsoft doesn't necessarily understand that reason. Um, so it always is fun to uh, you know sit there and track a ticket through the entire process to see what's failing in it. Um, but then the final thing is just, I found out the hard way that you really want to keep your own repository and have all of your nodes point to that as opposed to uh, letting them hit the public repos. That was about a good week and a half of troubleshooting, figuring out why things got to Any questions on the administration side? All right, I'll pass it over to Mike. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name's Mike Shiro, I'm one of the software developers Right at Google, where I work largely with data collection and primarily all .NET for pretty much my entire career. Um, so when we decided to, to make this change and, and jump over and instead of using Hadoop, it was a little bit daunting at first. I'm just going to talk a little bit about from our development perspective of what we did to kind of ramp up, and, and we're still not there yet, but as we're ongoing, uh, what are things to look at, especially anybody who's thinking of doing that from a Windows perspective and kind of afraid of at first, so Let's talk a little bit about some of the differences we have here. Um, in terms of 
dev environments, what we're used to working on. I think the main one here is just physical workstations. Um, using Visual Studio, SQL Server, the Microsoft Suite, also we're very familiar with these tools. Jumping over to you know your eclipses and, and whatnot, there's always just going to be some ramp up time, basic Linux skills ramp up time that you know we just haven't used in a long time. So as I say, you're getting reacquainted with an old friend. Um, another big one, RAM. Our machines are going to need a lot more RAM now that we're using virtual machines to start testing out all of our new stuff. So RAM, RAM, RAM. Very important. This stuff is obvious but and largely simple. Hey, we gotta write some Java code now. Um, I better get used to writing Java code. Pretty straightforward from .NET, specifically C sharp. Um, everything's largely the same. Getting used to traveling and on the, uh, traversing all those Java docs is fun. Um, using a lot more scripting languages than we're used to as well. Um, that was a large change. Um, just moving files around, uh, generating new data scripts, generating files that need as jobs to be run, say in Hive, whatnot. Just kind of things that we're used to having a different automated process as to uh, a Linux environment, is all that is. Um, another difference, um, the Hive query language, which we utilize a lot, again, very simple from SQL. You might get hung up on uh, custom UDFs, which we did at first, just realizing, oh, we can utilize this stuff, but I'm going to have to write some more Java code. Where should I write this? Oh, we've got to compile that jar. How do I do that again? Okay. So, getting simple stuff, but straightforward. Now, during our process of deciding, you know, where are we going with this? What, what prototypes we want to create? Some proof of concepts. Um, started thinking down the line, where's our product map going? What are we going to start using? And, and one of the big ones was we'd like to use Avro, which, as we just uh, heard earlier today, Avro's great. <laughs> Caveat, .NET support, still not fully baked. Um, as we saw in that, uh, one of the earlier slides with, with the, uh, the table there, .NET, uh, specifically C Sharp, has core support, but not data file support. So essentially for our use case, which we wanted to basically use a Windows app to write an Avro file and then that will later be digested uh, via Java MapReduce or whatnot, just couldn't, couldn't be possible at this state. Um, we do have uh, a JIRA open for this very issue. Um, it's pretty dormant right now, uh, so nobody's really working on it yet. We're hoping if we ever get that magical free time that everybody talks about, uh, maybe we'll start be able to work on that as well. So another roadblock we hit um, was Flume. And this was uh, half roadblock, half like us overthinking things a little bit here, I think. Um, the idea being, here's this use case of, we have log data, we want to collect it and put it in HDFS look that up and, hey, there's Flume. Hey, there's Flume for Windows. Great. This should work perfectly. Unfortunately, as uh, some of our devs know, it was just various implementation woes throughout the process that kept piling up, um, whether it be uh, differences between file types uh, in terms of like new, new, new lines and how the file is stored. Um, in codings, we were getting unordered bytes. So it was just after a while, we started thinking, you know, this is, you know, a couple of weeks in, why are we spinning our wheels here when we could just dumb this problem down, figure it out, you know, all we really need is this log collector service to get these files into HDFS. So that's basically what we did. Um, it's a simple Java application, uh, listens on a TCP socket for data, collects it, eventually writes that. It's basically JSON, JSON data converts it into an Avro file, which we've already defined for the schema, and now it's sending it into HDFS. Um, we didn't really need all the overhead we found of Flume, even though, you know, 
as a product itself, it works great for what it does, but just a lot of things we didn't need. Um, our final roadblock we hit was on the, more of on the h -based side, was thrift. We wanted to, had a couple pr proof of concepts of just reading data out of HBase. Unfortunately, again, .NET uh, implementation not fully baked. Um, it seems to be pretty trivial to add this though. Uh, there's, I, I posted a, a website there on a, a repository of GitHub that is attempting to do that. It's pretty much there. Um, it just it's a matter of converting the Java autogens, code autogen stuff to uh, the .NET world. But again, just a roadblock that we kind of did not expect. So now some of the stuff that really helped us get off the ground and worked as advertised, one being Scoop. Um, and this was before we even saw that, or that Microsoft even had a connector, which is largely just piggybacking off of everything Scoop has anyway. Um, really simple way to get data into your, your system, um, to get it seeded with data so they can really start getting into actually doing analysis on it. The imports and exports were great. Very minor gotchas that are you going to see whenever you're importing or exporting data anywhere. Um, the one caveat being this batch mode. Um, this, again, not really documented all that well. It's maybe found once in the entire documentation, um, but very important for when exporting large amounts of data back to SQL Server. We found um, the way that it does multi-row inserts is not compatible with SQL Server. Use this option. Works great. Along those lines, Hive really helped us in terms of the mindset change of getting away from SQL and, and moving into big data, but at the same time using a lot of the same language constructs that we're used to. Um, as I said earlier, very similar to SQL and allowed us to do quick analysis on existing data we already had without having to cripple the servers we already have on the SQL Server side. Um, so a lot of, as we know, a lot of that stuff just would take forever to run. And at least now we can do that in our own little environment. So again, great. Um, another, another great thing about Hive is that it eased the point of entry into HBase as well. If I didn't say wanted to write a bunch of Java code to get data into into my HBase server as well. It's very simple to use the storage handler in Hive. Just point it to data, uh, create a new table for that, and now I can actually start quickly using, uh, writing out code in, for my web interface to start ingesting HBase data as well. Um, so that really helped a lot in terms of getting us to see the whole picture right off the bat in, uh, in some of our prototypes to show that, hey, we can really use this technology. So I guess what we really learned in the beginning was there's just a ton of new information when you decide to jump into the new. There's, as you spoke of earlier, who names these things? There's like 15 different names you gotta start, like you start hearing, you start hearing Zookeeper, Uzi, I, Pig, Scoop. It's hard to keep track of all this at the first stop. So super important to just take it one at a time. Um, we're lucky that we, we kind of figured out like the last couple of slides, I said, you know, focus on scoops. Let's, let's just get the data into the system first. All right, what's next? Okay, we want to start analyzing it. Well, let's, let's take a look at Hive, or let's write a Java map reduce for this one. Let's write a Java map reduce using Avro. Let's use one, uh, write one using sequence files, et cetera. Um, so it's a great concept for any sort of software design anyway, but again, it bears repeating modularity really, really helps simplify the process of, of learning something new, especially when there's so many different technologies. Um, some final thoughts. 
we're hiring. <laughs> we're constantly looking for people to help us do this better, <laughs> help us to learn to do better, uh, to start writing more Java MapReduce, to start utilizing our wonderful cluster that we have. Clusters. <laughs> Sorry, clusters. <laughs> Yes, it's not BS at guru.com. <laughs> <laughs> it's all a scam. Um, so yeah, we're definitely hiring, uh, looking for great smart people, Java, C++, C Sharp, Python, we don't care. <laughs> so thank you. We'll have an open mic for a while. Does anybody have any questions or anything? Yeah, or? Um, I think they just started. Uh, thanks everybody for coming. If you guys want to stick around, uh, talk a little bit, mingle, network, <coughs> kibitz. <laughs> Okay, I'll check. I'll check. What was the last thing you said? Kibitz? <laughs> Yiddish? Uh, how do we turn off the uh, stop? Are you an alligator? I am. Um, I think we are used to. Uh, Did you leave recently? Oh, okay. Oh, cool.